Hi and welcome back to my workshop. This is Lucas, a violin maker in Cremona. This is the third part of a series How to become a violin maker and today I'm going to be talking to Dylan Cole. He's a violin maker in Chicago, USA, but I'm going to let him introduce himself better. The recording was made on March of this year, but only now I managed to edit and post it. Sorry about that. So keep in mind that there might be some slight differences, in particular regarding the cost of life. Now with that said, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to hit the like button if you're interested in this type of content. And let's get into the interview. Hey Dylan, nice to meet you. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Dylan Cole. I'm a violin maker and repairer in uh, Chicago in the US and uh, I'm here with my friend Lucas. So um, speaking of Chicago, you did the, Ch the Chicago School of Violin Making, right? Yeah, yep. It's a three-year program up in Skokie, which is uh, kind of north part of Chicago. Um, really nice little place there. It was, uh, yeah, I kind of stumbled upon it accidentally. Um, accidentally. And, yeah, yeah. It was the way I got there was was very strange. Um, you know, I I played the violin in high school, and and I. Apparently, my grandpa grew up with a guy who ended up going to the Cremona school oh. um, and and settled down in, in the little town where my grandpa grew up, uh, Fremont, Michigan. And uh, he had always been telling me to uh, get out to Tim's workshop. Um, the maker was Tim Jansma. And um, yeah, I, after many years of just not really thinking much about it, I... I finally ended up making an appointment and wandering out to his workshop in the middle of the woods and um, was immediately just just enamored with how how cool the workshop was with with the environment and I knew immediately like I need to figure out how how to do this. I, somebody needs to teach me how to become a violin maker because this looks like too much fun. So and, uh, you, where are you originally from? Are you from Chicago? No, no. I grew up in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is about three hours east of Chicago. So I guess uh, the Chicago Violin School is the closest one to your area. Yeah, and that's really what it came down to. There's, uh, as far as the uh, schools in uh, the U.S., you've got the Salt Lake School, you've got the North Bennett Street School in Boston, and then, yeah, the Chicago School. And yeah, it just came down, it was um, the most affordable as well, and also the closest to home. And um, Chicago seemed like a really cool place to uh, be able to live. And so I think that was also part of the factors. That's nice. Um, so let, let's talk a tiny bit about the school itself. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can tell me something more about it. Um, how many hours of workshop do you have? Let's say, how many hours are you actually dedicating to the construction of instruments? Um, or repairs. Right. I think it was about, you know, it's almost a full time job. I think. I think it was about thirty to forty hours a week, depending. You know, I, I think I I might have made ugh, I might have put in more hours um, just because I I had a tendency to get there early in the morning when the instructors first opened the door, and then um, on certain days you could stay later. Um, the instructors wouldn't teach you anything. That was kind of the, the rule, but they would allow you to use the workshop every now and then to uh, stay a little bit longer if you wanted to uh, continue pro progressing on your instrument. That's actually very nice and something quite useful, mm -hmm. I guess, um, especially because people might have different schedules and, and everything. And I can see that you're an early guy because uh, well, trying to program this interview um, you always said times that I was like, it's so early for him. How can be, <laughs> how is it possible that he wants to call it that guy. time? <laughs> well, that's, that's good, I guess. Uh, it's always nice when you can start early and you feel like there's no noise and you're the only one who's like there walking the wood, hear the sound and no noise from the street or anything. Yeah, I will say though, the most of the mornings were pretty quiet except for, um, our administrative assistant who does all the office stuff he's a trombonist and oh. so he usually uses his mornings to uh practice the trombone and at first it could be 
kind of jarring, a little surprising to start your morning with some intense trombone music. But after a couple of years, I think I got used to it and uh, came to enjoy his practicing in the morning. I'm wondering if the neighbors got to enjoy it after like a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's not the right question to, to you. Um, how, <laughs> how many students are there more or less in each workshop or? I think the total enrollment hovers around 30 to 35 students. Um, that's about as much as the school can hold, or at okay. least when I was going there. So yeah, pretty small and uh, two, um, two instructors. So you would normally have them divided up. Um, one instructor would take your beginner kind of first year students and you would build two violin bodies one at a time um and then after you had those done then you would start working with the uh other instructor and he would teach you how to do scrolls and then introduce you to varnish um and how to set them up and so after your first two instruments are completely done you're kind of on your own and well on your own but they give you a little more freedom you know you have enough of a foundation to kind of start progressing along at your own pace and you don't need every single step checked by the instructor before going on. So yeah, that's when you kind of get a taste of uh, a little bit of freedom to build at your own pace and a little bit in your own style. So let's say that in, you can kind of use the teachers to ask questions, to ask the doubts that you have, but they're not going to be following all the way and checking absolutely everything you do unless you go and directly ask them about it. Exactly. And and they'll make their rounds around the school and kind of check in and just make sure you, you're uh, on the right track. And you're not cutting interview. yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, they don't always check or they can't catch everything. Um, for example, the first viola that I built, I was so excited because I, I was getting ready to do the next set. And, you know, I was laying out all of my, my measurements on the neck block. And sure enough, I cut the neck foot too short. Oh. I was, I forgot to account for the depth of the mortise of the neck. And so I ended up having to do a neck graft, which at the time I was a little upset about because, you know, your, your first instrument that you're kind of doing on your own and you immediately have a, a pretty major mistake. But then I was, I was actually kind of, um, excited in a way to learn how to do a neck graft and that was kind of my first introduction to uh, some restoration and repair well i guess yeah you can always see the positive side of it and... right <laughs> you gotta make the best of it so uh speaking again about the school what's uh what's the program like how many years is it three years uh they're divided up into trimesters um and one of those years or one of those trimesters um you do a repair and restoration course um, where they usually have a guest instructor come in for what is that about two months two and a half months maybe and um, they'll give you a, a really basic understanding too of um, well it's it's an introduction to repair and restoration they'll you know teach you uh, the difference of a good setup on an instrument you'll normally get introduced to uh, doing varnish retouch, um, some crack repairs, maybe some edge work, neck grafts. Um, they usually try to teach you how to pour plaster casting so you can do sound post patches. So like I said, it's a really good crash course, just enough to kind of give you the idea of what you could experience in a workshop. But you would say that uh, the school is mainly oriented towards construction or a bit of both? Yeah, it's, it's definitely the focus is on this uh, construction. Um, it was originally created to facilitate a need for qualified luthiers to enter the shops. Um, you know, at the time in the US, um, when the school was founded, there weren't many local luthiers, you know, it, it wasn't a, a really strong tradition. And there were all these violin shops that were opening up and they needed competent, qualified workers. Um, and so you either had to know somebody from, you know, the Mittenwald school or the Corona school, 
and try to get them over to the U.S. Or you had, you know, to build a school to teach them how to do it here. And uh, yeah, so while the school is primarily focused on teaching you how to build instruments from the ground up, I feel like the the underlying focus is to prepare you for um, entering the workforce in, in the violin shops. I guess at the end of the day, that's what a proper school should do, I guess. Like, yeah, just preparing yeah. for, for the actual job. Yeah. So um, when can you enroll the course? Uh, how uh, is there any application process yeah, that you need you, to take? What language is the course in? You need to be uh, at least 18 years old by the time you would start school, I believe. Um, high school diploma or an equivalent. Um, and if you're coming from, if you're an international student, you need to be able to speak English or have, be at least competent enough in the English language. Um, but other than that, that's, there's no real requirements. You don't need to be a woodworker. You don't need to be a violin player either. You can, although the school tends to attract people from one side or the other. Um, which is always interesting, you know, when, when you get these two kind of polar opposite sides of the field meeting. Um, but yeah, other than that, no, no real hard requirements outside of that. So you, if you're a violinist or if you're interested in learning how to play the instrument, then I wanted to share with you that I recently started a new collaboration with Tombez. They are an amazing platform that offer unique masterclasses from world-renowned musicians and they have a special discount deal for my followers offering a 30% off and a 14-day trial using the code FABROVIOLENCE. Link in the description for more. So you can actually go to school even if you have never touched a tool or a piece of wood before in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of the fun part and, and also the challenge for uh, the first year students is kind of bringing everybody up to speed and trying to get them all at the same level and that goes for both ways. You know, you, you have the violinists and the musicians who are coming in who've never touched wood. And then you've got, you know, these competent woodworkers who have never played an instrument. And so to get, try to get everybody on the same playing field is, is a really interesting uh, dynamic. So you, do you also have violin lessons? I mean, playing? Yes. Yep. Yep. And in addition to, you know, the regular coursework on how to build the instrument, um, there were I can't remember if it was weekly or bi-weekly violin lessons, um, 30 minutes with an instructor, okay. um, which was really nice for me because I, I had never had lessons um, before I started school. So, you know, I, I knew how to play the violin enough to kind of fiddle around on it, but I've never taken lessons or had that kind of discipline. So that was, that was really nice for me. And uh, um, I really feel like I learned a lot from that. Um, and then in addition to the violin lessons, there were also um, drawing classes where you would learn how to do a, a technical or a mechanical drawing of the violin. Um, and that, that was very challenging as well. Um, I, re I remember the first day just to kind of see where everybody's coming from and what skills you have. The instructor set up a, a still life on the table of just some wood and like a block plane and some other tools and said, all right, wherever you're sitting, draw what you see and let's see what you got. And, and that was, that was a real, uh, that was pretty challenging for me. Who's, you know, again, never really spent a lot of time drawing. Um, but overall those lessons I found very useful as well, because it, it gave you a very, um, a very detailed and holistic understanding of what you were building. You know, you got, you had to draw the linings, you had to know what your edge margins were and how they interact. And then you get to see where the purfling falls in relation to the linings. Um, you know, all the geometry associated with the next set and, and all the other setup too, that becomes very evident to you when you're drawing this, this, uh, technical drawing, um, so I think that was also a very useful thing to do. Did you um, have, um, sorry, uh, did you have uh, history lessons? Let's say violin making history where you studied different makers. Yeah, yeah, that was also part of it. Um, sometimes would wrap in with with the drawing lessons, but there was a, it was also, you just wanted to have a, a general idea of the, the timeline. You know, yep. when was all of this happening in history? 
who apprenticed with who, who was in what city at what time in history and what was going on in that city, you know, it, um, all part of having this bigger understanding of, of this field and kind of give you an idea as to, you know, why, why one maker's instruments might look like another maker's instruments or who influenced who at the time. Um, so yeah, those were all part of, you know, your, your construction, your history, your playing and your technical drawing were all part of the coursework at the time. That, that's amazing. It sounds like a very complete course and you don't yeah. have, you don't have any other subjects that are, let's say, unrelated to the making. No, no, not that I could think of, you know, and there were, there was, um, a lot of people were pretty free to explore different topics that may have spun off from violin making. I, I found that there was a lot of interest in, um, kind of mechanics and machinery. And if you could understand, um, you know, the composition of the metals of the tools that we're using and why some metal or some, you know, ratios might be better than others when you're talking about like carbon content or steel alloys. Um, you know, that was always interesting to kind of talk and pick the brain of people with and, you know, then you can fall down the, the chemistry related rabbit hole and start going into varnish and varnish making and, and all of that kind of stuff. So the school was really good at just kind of, you know, you, you had this melting pot of people who are coming from all different backgrounds, you know, not, not all of us were fresh out of high school or anything like that. Some of us had been through college. A lot of people were coming after having a full career in a whole different field. Um, and we're looking to learn violin making as kind of a hobby in a way. And so you have all of these people coming from all different walks of life with whole different experiences and perspectives. And I think that was really, really cool to see how, how we all would approach different problems or, or uh, different ideas. So you don't have, uh, let's say you can go to school whenever you want. You don't, yeah. you don't have a minimum attendance. You don't have to go. Um... Uh, they're definitely what, like they did keep attendance because you, you know, they wanted to make sure you were there, you know, four out of the five days, you know, okay. assuming, you know, whatever happens, life is life. But they also wanted to make sure that if you're going to enroll in this course, that you're going to stay dedicated because there's usually a wait list of other people who are waiting to enter the school. And so it was really important to stress that your seat is valuable. And if you're not going to take advantage of it, there are plenty of other people who would love to be sitting in your workbench spot right now. So, so about the enrollment, when can you enroll the school? Um, I think, I think it enrolls any time now you, you can send an application anytime and then they'll just pick you up at the start of whatever trimester works out wherever there's room. Um, so like for me, when I, when I sent my application in, um, I was, I think it was about a year that I had to wait to start my coursework, which actually worked out because that gave me time to prepare for moving to Chicago and, and getting all of that stuff in order before I actually started school. Um, I know some people, um, sent in their application and were in school within a couple months. So it really just depends on where the availability is and how quickly they want to place you. Okay, but it's nice here that you can start every trimester and you don't have to yeah. necessarily wait a full year. Of course, if, if right. there is some space, some room for you. Yeah, exactly. So you also mentioned that the Chicago school was the cheapest. Uh, is, it, is it that way? How much does it cost? I believe it's still the, the most affordable. I think it's when I was going to school for the three years total, I think it was close to $36,000. Um, and I, I don't know what the North Bennett school runs and I don't know how much the Salt Lake school is, but I do know that the Chicago school was significantly easier to afford. Okay. Okay. That's good. And what about the cost of living in the city, housing, uh, bills and everything, all, all those sort of things that are not necessarily related to the violin making, but to those costs that students who decide to enroll the school will have to pay. Mm -hmm. um, 
cost of living in that area, you can actually find some some rather decent um, apartments there um, in Skokie, Rogers Park, Evanston, that whole area. Um, it definitely has, has some really good available space for uh, people who are students and, and looking in that price range. So, you know, like you, you could expect maybe for a single person, five to seven hundred dollars for your rent. Um, you know, taxes and, and stuff are kind of higher in Chicago from what I've seen. So and food cost isn't too bad. There's actually that's something I kind of miss about being up north was that there are a bunch of these just kind of smaller local markets that were really affordable and had a really good variety of food. Um, so food wasn't a huge issue. Um, I think your primary thing is going to be um, finding an apartment and also figuring out how you're going to get to school. Um, you know, having a car is fine, but you know, street parking in that in those neighborhoods can be pretty difficult. You know, it's really busy. So um, for me, I I lived maybe like a mile away from the school, and um, so I would just pick up my bike and and just bike to school. Um, for most of the year and and then the days that it was you know a thunderstorm or if it was icy and and a foot of snow then there's bus lines that are running pretty frequently so public transit is a, a also a good choice um so yeah I, I think that's your biggest hurdle though is just where are you going to live and uh how are you going to get to school do people usually share flats uh let's say between valley maker students or yeah yeah there was definitely um you know and there's there's kind of a sense of community too with that while you're in the school every now and then there would be you know there's this communal bulletin board and you know sometimes job postings go up there sometimes people who are selling tools are posting up there and every now and then there would be the uh posting of a, a possible future student who's looking for roommates and, and wants to live somewhere close and with other violin makers. So um, yeah, that normally works out most of the time. Um, I had a couple friends who all shared a, a, an apartment together and it was kind of cool because it came with a basement and uh, they could just set up all of their you know tools down in the basement. So when they were done at school, they come home and keep building or, or work on their own projects. So. Usually it works out to uh, live with other violin makers. That was kind of going to be my next question. If Is it normal to have a workbench at home and keep working? Oh, absolutely. And, and for me, it was, you know, I didn't have space for a workbench, but I made, you know, a couple quick jigs so that I could use my kitchen table as a workbench. And, and I, I built an entire instrument um, while I was in school, after school, just at my kitchen table on the weekends. So it's... You, you'll find a way. Everybody finds a way. <laughs> yeah, as they say, well, that's a way, that's a way. Absolutely. So you live, uh, well, there's police in Chicago. What does the city have to offer? I mean, it's a massive city, so I guess there's so a much. lot. I, there was so much. Now, I had never been to Chicago before I started school, which was kind of strange because it's, it's a major city, not very far from where I grew up. I've been to Chicago. Time. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of my friends had, had gone on weekend trips to Chicago. And so it was, that was kind of the running joke was Dylan's never been to Chicago and, and he's just moving there. And I, I remember the first couple months we spent after we moved here, I was just completely blown away. I love walking downtown. I love walking by the lake, down by the river. There's always something to do. Um, you know, I, nowadays we love to go and, and go to the orchestra, um, catch concerts there. Um, all the restaurants, the food is incredible. You can always find a new place to eat. Um, there's, there's just this overwhelming sense of community around here. Um, that's, that's really like Anthony Bourdain. I, I often come back to Anthony Bourdain and his ode to Chicago and, and saying how you wake up in Chicago and you know you're in Chicago. You couldn't be anywhere else. And how it's this strange middle ground, you know, it's a metropolis, 
So you've got the big city vibes to it, but you're also in the Midwest. So you have this Midwest culture, you know, we're not trying to prove anything to each other. We're just, you know, all trying to do our thing and, and all trying to uh, get our jobs done and, and do it to the best that we can. And so I, I think that really is, is the, the feeling I got when I started, you know, when I started living in Chicago was that it's a city of broad shoulders, you know, and we make no small plans or the two like quintessential uh, Chicago sayings. And um, I think that definitely stands and or rings true um, with everything I see in Chicago. So um, how how easy is it to get a job, let's say while studying, even if it's not related to violin making, just to cover the costs of living? Mm -hmm. And then how easy or how difficult is it to get a job uh, as a violin maker or related to violin making? both in Chicago or if it's more convenient to uh, maybe to go somewhere else? So, yeah, during school, you know, at least half of every, half of the students have a, a job outside of school, usually a part time job to cover expenses. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty easy to uh, to find and locate a job. Um, usually it's a restaurant job. Most of my friends worked in restaurants, um, but that's that's usually not too big of an issue um as far as finding a job in the field it's kind of a toss-up it, it really depends on the the overall health of the chicago violin community i guess you know how how are all the other shops doing um because there's there's clearly a lot of shops in chicago and many of them hire students while they're still in school um, to just do, you know, basic rental setup or, or you know, really easy, um, low cost jobs. Um, there's a violin shop just down the road from the school, maybe less than a mile, um, the Seaman Violins, and they often would employ a student or two um, while they were still at school just to do, you know, like I said, just do the rentals and stuff. And that was a really good way to kind of get your foot in the door as a student, you know, get that first bit of experience in a shop and um, start learning kind of how a shop operates, what the expectations are for you and um, how to interact with other people in this industry and in the field. So that can, kind of go back and forth. I know some years it seemed like everybody I knew was holding down a job while they were in school at another violin shop. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not too sure nowadays how everybody's doing. Um, but yeah, so then after you get out of school, that's, that's at least a little easier to uh, find a job either in town or more often than not, you're going to have to travel for, uh, for a job. Um, you really can't guarantee that there's going to be an availability um, wherever you want to go. You know, I when I first started school, I thought I was going to just put in the three years uh, in Chicago, get my certificate, and then try to go back to Grand Rapids and work at that violin shop. But I came, well, two things happened. I, I realized you know, yeah, there's no guarantee that they're going to have a spot for me or want to hire somebody when I'm graduating. So that's kind of silly. And and then two, I realized I really, really like Chicago and I don't think I want to leave Chicago. So I, I'd prefer to find a shop in uh, Chicago. So as far as finding a job, you know, it's it really, obviously, it's on the individual. Um, it will require a lot of um, effort on your side. You need to be proactive. Uh, I think the trimester before I graduated, I, I knew I wanted to stay in Chicago. And so I started going around downtown to all the local shops. Um, I had a viola with me that I had just finished that I was really happy with. And just started knocking on doors and, and trying to get a meeting with anybody who would see me and just, you know, here's my work. Here's what I'm doing. I'm going to be graduating in a couple months. Do you think there's a spot for me? And uh, yeah, that ended up working out for me. I ended up getting a job at William Harris Lee 
and uh, stayed there for two years. And, and that was a pretty good deal for me. But I know that's not always a typical thing to happen. And again, more often than not, you're going to have to travel to uh, land a job. Yeah, I guess that many times it just depends on, let's say, how good you are or how many times it's how willing you are to to show your work to other people. I feel like many Absolutely. times it's very normal to be a bit fearful when you're just starting to go to other violin makers. You feel you're oh, going yeah. to be so criticized. We, probably you are going to be criticized. And because Absolutely. at the end of the day, you are going for a criticism. <laughs> yeah, you're going for a criticism. You want the violin maker to be honest and tell you right how yeah, to you're, you're not going to learn anything if they say oh yeah it looks great and then send you on your way you, you didn't learn anything yep so uh in in an email we exchanged before you mentioned something about Bainan Fushi uh the shop yeah. Yeah, because I, I also have a story but I want to hear your yours first yeah so that was kind of the cool part I think one of the cool things about the Chicago school is it has all of these you know very reputable um, violin shops in town and they you know they all have a good relationship with the school and so more often than at least once a year I remember we would as a school take a trip down into the into the loop into the fine arts building and go visit Bainan Fushi and uh, speak with Joe Bine and he would usually have like seven or eight you know, strads, guarnaries, whatever was in the vault, all laid out on the table. And he would he would put on a whole a whole conversation, a whole lecture on kind of the history of these instruments. You know, he would have a nice spread, kind of like early strads and Amadis, and then showing the the influence between the two makers and and you know who may have taught whom and and then move on to you know the guarnaries and just again kind of take us through a little history lecture on these instruments which was really cool and very knowledgeable and um yeah not only talk about the history but also you know the kind of construction differences and, and the archings and the sounds and all that stuff and so i remember as, as a student as you know my first year of seeing these instruments you know and just being terrified to even hold or, or be close to, you know, these million dollar instruments. Like, who am I to be trusted with holding this, this valuable piece of, you know, historically significant, you know, instrument? Um, but yeah, as, as it goes on, um, they, uh, Bain and Fushi, they, they typically, if they didn't arrange for uh, the school to come to them, then every now and then you would get Again, either Biden Fushi or, or sometimes like uh, Kenneth Warrens would come up to the school with a couple notable instruments and, and give a small lecture. And um, yeah, I think that was the most most interesting and, and very useful thing as a new student was to see, OK, this is what we're trying to build or, or along the lines of what we should be influenced by. Because it's amazing that, as I mentioned, I went to Chicago once to take the instru an instrument to a client of mine. And mm -hmm. she, uh, she said, oh, you have to visit this place, the violin dealers. And she took me to Bain and Fushi and she had told them as well that I was going to go. And I, I was shocked that they did the same thing. They had a table yeah. prepared with, I think yep. there was like eight or nine instruments. Yeah. Uh, a couple of strats, a couple of forneri, uh, some amati. And I remember thinking in some places, if you want to hold one of these, it would be almost impossible, first of all. And then they, right. would, they might ask you to wear gloves or something like that. And it seems like mm -hmm. we're, we're making great advertisement here for Pan and Fushi, yeah. but the truth is that <laughs> they were incredibly nice. At least I remember right. me, they were incredibly nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah and, and I got to experience that, that nice vibe there in Chicago as well. You might be wondering where I got this amazing t-shirt and this wonderful phone case. Well, if you want to help support my channel while getting some nice violin making apparel, then you can find these things on my Redbubble account. Link in description. Yeah, and I, like I said, that's I think all part of the Chicago community. Like, you know, most of us, most of the shops downtown have been through the schools, either, you know, either from Chicago schools or have people who work there who went through the Chicago school program and you know we're end of the day you know these shops may be competing with each other but they all seem to have this same idea of 
of um, doing things to help that next generation of students come up and, and show them, you know, kind of what what they might be trying to do. And, and it's just all part of a really good community, I think. Well, that's very nice to hear. So yeah. now, now that we're done talking with, let's say, with this nice part, let's, let me ask you, what's the most difficult thing with the biggest challenge you think uh, that there is to become a violin maker? I think it's also the things that make it the best part. You know, it's, there's, there's always that challenge, you know, of, of pushing yourself, um, you know, the challenge of, of feeling like an imposter. I, I think that's something that I still struggle with, you know, how, why, why are people buying my instruments? Who, who am I to uh, say, you know, that this instrument is, is good or not? Um, you know, there's always this challenge to push yourself to try to be better, to try to build a better instrument. And, and that can be really difficult um, when there's so many variables that go into making a good instrument. Um, you know, you were saying about how it's, it can be scary to bring your instrument to show and to try to get critiques on. And absolutely, I was terrified as I was walking downtown with my instrument because, again, I knew this is only the third instrument I've ever built. It's not going to be anything special, or it shouldn't be, I don't think. And, and you know, it, it was really hard in some cases to show it to people who have been in this field, who have been building for you know, 20, 30, 40 years and, and to try to uh, approach it with humility and and also know that what they're saying isn't personal. They're, they're giving an honest critique of what they see and you need to learn how to grow from that, to, to take criticisms, but then adjust and change whatever you're doing so that you can solve those criticisms. Um, I think that's that's the biggest challenge is, is yeah, accepting critiques and, and growing from them. And what about the, the thing you like the most about being a violin maker? I love that. <laughs> every bit of it, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's exciting from the very beginning when I'm preparing the mold and, and getting blocks split to the first time that you're stringing up the instrument and getting ready to play it for the first time, everything in between. It's, it's exciting. It's fun. It's challenging. There's, you know, always something new. There's always something to make you think and, and make you remember, okay, last time I did this, I, I didn't quite nail this shape. So what do I need to change? Or, or is this really what a, a Guarneri corner looks like? You know, a Del Jesu corner looks like, is this, what I should be doing, or do I need to go downtown and, and find somebody with a Guarneri and really take a look at it? Um, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy soaking up all of the new information and traveling down all different rabbit holes. You know, I, I love reading about everybody else's perspective. I want to know, you know, what, what varnishes are people using? Why did they switch from this recipe to that recipe? There's, it, it never ends. There's there's no clear end to to building these instruments. You know, you can always change. You can always grow, and it's part of being you know working with an imperfect material of wood, which is breathing, which is moving, which doesn't hold still, and and trying to form it into this violin to compete to to play in a very subjective field where everybody's going to hear something slightly different and it's I, I think that's part of the allure to it is you're always chasing something that maybe won't ever have a solution or, or you won't ever hit that final instrument you know yeah it's a, it's a nice thing of being such a subjective thing and that, mm. at the end of the day that's as well like that criticism should never be taken personally because right. it is subjective, like there's yeah. nothing that you can say, this is exactly this way. Of course, there are some measurements to respect and some things, let's say, that we have to follow. But at the end of the day, right. a lot of the style can be subjective. The sound is subjective. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. And as you say, it's never ending. It's really, yeah. really never ending. So um, an another question would be, uh, what's the biggest piece of advice that you have received from another violin maker? 
my friend Tommy, I think he gave me some of the best advice that I, I still think about today. And, and I hope Tommy watches this when it comes out. Um, at the end of the day, it's just a violin. We can get ourselves so worked up and tied up because there's all these different ways and it's a never ending battle to, it is, there's no final form here. And we can get so worked up about some of these details that it drives us mad. Um, I, I've, I've sat and, and just struggled with purfling corners for, for days because I can't quite get it the way that I think I need it to be. And, but at the end of the day, we got to step back. It's just a violin and there's always tomorrow. We can always build another violin. That's, that's the best part. This isn't our last violin until it is our last violin, but there's always another violin and this, that's all it is. It's just a violin. And, and to have that and to kind of take a breath take a step back and then come back to your bench refreshed and, and with a new mind really, really helps you. Um, what's in your work bench at the moment? What are you working on? A couple things. <laughs> I, uh, I just finished up setting up, um, I think that's my 11th instrument. And so that's up at the workshop that I work at, Kenneth Stein Violins. Um, I work there two days a week in the shop, helping out at the bench. And then the rest of my week is spent at home working on building instruments for them. Um, so I've got a, a Guarneri Del Jesu modeled violin up at the shop right now that I'm pretty happy with. I've got a Stradivari PG form violin going on right now. Um, I'm at Perfling on, on both the plates, so looking forward to sitting down and, and just really getting at it today. Which is so then, different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I've got um, a, a friend of mine, he's got a cello in that just needs a little bit of adjustment. So I was going to take a look at that, maybe cut a new sound post for it, or maybe a new bridge if it needs it. So a little bit of everything going on at the bench this day, these days. So uh, anything else you want to add? I think at the end of the day, let's. What I see is in this community, as 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 luthiers, I think it's really important, and and I have been seeing this. It's that we all understand that this field is hard enough. It's it's very difficult, and we don't get anywhere by fighting with each other, by keeping secrets about you know strategies or or ideas. I think. The more this community can share with each other, the, the more we can grow, the more that we can help others. You know, there's, there's plenty to go around, is, is my impression. There's plenty of violin making to be done. There's plenty of violins to be sold. And that it's really important that, especially to the new makers who are just starting in this field, it can be very intimidating, um, terrifying to think that you're you're able to stand amongst you know the the luthiers who've been doing this for 30 40 years and um yeah at the end of the day we're we're all in this and and able to do this together and i think the more we share it, it's just all the better help each other and i think is uh what i'd want to get at that's just amazing and i completely agree with you yeah yeah Okay. So what about yourself? Do you have any, I, I want to know your advice. What, what's the best advice you've had? Oh, the best adv advice that I've had. That's a very difficult question. Um, yeah. But I guess it's probably uh, similar to what, to the one that you got. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a violin. Uh, mm -hmm. We work so many hours here and there's so much competition here in Cremona, of course. So we can, we can go mad. We can just, keep working, 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 and working. It just never ends. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's important to just think, okay, it's just a violin. Yeah. Just, so, so I think uh, I pro was probably never been told this advice with the same words, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it, it's something along that way. Yeah. The message was still there. Yeah. It's something, it's always something related to that, which is mm -hmm. mistakes happen or whatever it is that happen. Uh, and, and sometimes there are other things to do as well. So try try to, to think that it's just an instrument, which of course you want to make it perfectly, but 
right. that is an instrument. Still gotta try. And as we said, it is subjective. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's always along that way. Fantastic. Okay, so if you have nothing else to add, I would just like to thank you for being here. And this was for sure um, very helpful. Yeah, I, I thank you for reaching out to me. This has been really fun. And uh, I always enjoy hearing other people's stories and perspectives. So yeah, I look forward to uh, when you release this video. Yep, I will let you know. Thank you. All right. And bye. Thank you. Bye. So that was the interview for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comments below if you did. And if there's anything else you would have wanted me to ask. Now with that said, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, to hit the like button, and I will see you next time.